Well, welcome everyone uh, to this workshop on uh, efficient large-scale AI. Um, as you may know, uh, one of our goals is really to democratize AI and to make it available to, and useful to as many as possible. And despite the many successes uh, we witnessed over the past decade, there's still a long way to go. Um, and today we want to approach this topic through the lens of efficiency. So this is a word that has uh, different meanings for different people. So really we will cover three main topics. Uh, the first one is skills acquisition and new capabilities. So, you know, how can we adapt models in continually changing environments so that they can cover a broader set of scenarios? Um, so we'll discuss questions such as data efficiency. Uh, and really, the idea is to make AI more useful in, in more cases, especially those outside of the data rich environments. The second topic is, is training and inference, inference efficiency. Um, so the large training and inference cost of models puts them out of reach of many individuals and institutions. Um, so how can we transfer all of these successes in environments that are not compute rich? And the third one is aligning models with human intent. Um, as we put these models into the lives of more people, uh, it's important to enable control and feedback tools to make sure that they are truly for the benefits of the many and not uh, of the few. So this workshop is being recorded. Um, each talk will be followed by open discussion. Um, so the discussion can be about the talk itself, but really the way we view this is more the talk as a way to ground the conversation somewhere, but we're happy if the, if the discussion leads somewhere else. So usually these are not questions between the speaker and the audience. Uh, these are really, this is really a conversation with everyone involved. And, and we wanted to keep the workshop fairly small in terms of number of attendees, really to encourage that kind of, of conversation. So feel free to engage. If for any reason you don't feel comfortable, you know, uh, speaking, you can also talk in the chat. Uh, in Teams, usually there's an ongoing conversation happening in the chat. Uh, feel free to chime in, really uh, be, com be as comfortable as, as, as possible. Um, you may turn on the live captions uh, by clicking uh, the more uh, icon at the top uh, right corner and you can select turn on live captions. And yeah, at the end of the workshop, we'll have a survey. Um, as always with these things, we feel like we're running out of time. We can't cover everything we want to cover. So this is also a way for everyone to, to know each other uh, and, and to continue the conversation afterward. Um, so this is this is the day. Uh, briefly, roughly what I, what I said. So we have, uh, for, after each talk, we have a period for open discussion and we'll have a bunch of, of breaks um, throughout the day uh, because this is going to be uh, quite a long day. Uh, that being said, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce the, the first speaker, uh, Dr. Colin Raffel. So uh, Colin, you can actually take control if you want. Uh, so Dr. Colin Raffel is an assistant professor uh, at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and also a faculty researcher at Hugging Face. Um, his work revolves around adaptability and reusability of large language models and, and the, their performance in a few shot and zero shot environments. Um, he's also exploring what I think is incredibly exciting, uh, the notion of building models like we build open source software uh, with community developed and continually improved models. Uh, I'm a big fan of his research and I'm really excited to hear what they will talk about today. So, Colin. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the really generous intro and for inviting me to talk at this very cool workshop. So, last week at the bigger research summit, I gave a talk on some of the work done in my group on the research direction that Nicola just mentioned. Since this is a smaller audience, I'm planning to give a talk that's a little bit more informal, a little bit more preliminary, just kind of sharing some work that we're doing that's very, very much in flight and talking a bit about work being done by other people too in this research direction. So specifically, and I should double check that everyone can see my screen. I guess if yep. you, yeah, great. So, um, so we've started to call this broad research direction, this kind of umbrella, collaborative, communal, and continual machine learning. The order of those first three words doesn't matter. So it's kind of, it's kind of you can think of it as a set, <laughs> but it's just CCCML. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to first talk a bit about, you know, where are we as a broader community, not just in my lab, in terms of making CCCML possible. And then I'm going to make an argument that we actually have the research tools and advances to build a 
reasonably functional and hopefully useful version control system for CCCML right now. And then I'm going to talk about how we're actually trying to do that right now by creating this Git-based version control system for model checkpoints. And in tandem to building that Git-based system, which I will briefly demo today, and again, it's very, very preliminary work, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the model that we're building kind of as an initial test case of the version control system and to test out some of the ideas that, that I'll be discussing. So at this point in the talk, you may be thinking, wait a minute, aren't there already version control systems for models? Why is he talking about this? This is supposed to be research, supposed to be new, interesting stuff. You know, I've, I've used MLflow, I've used DVC or weights and biases. I've, you know, I've uploaded my model checkpoints to Hugging Face and someone made a pull request. Or, and, and there are a lot of systems out there for this and, and they're quite useful. And, and interesting, but, but let me just very briefly before I jump into uh, the rest of the talk, make a distinction between these existing systems and what we want to build, what we're building and, and what we want to exist. And that is that the way that most of these systems work is let's say, and not all of them integrate with Git, but let's say they integrate with Git. For the most part, they use Git LFS and they treat the model checkpoint just like a blob, like a, a data, you know, just a chunk of data like any other chunk of data. It's a binary file. It's not a, a, a you know, a, a piece of code that I can, um, you know, track changes to individual lines. It's just a big binary file. And I'm going to use Git LFS or some similar system that basically says, okay, take this binary blob, put it somewhere, you know, some remote server, somewhere on the cloud. And then instead of versioning the blob itself, I'm going to version a metadata file that says that the checksum of the file is this and you know this is this is some other metadata about the file and in doing so you can in tandem track your code and the checkpoint but you can't do things like merge two checkpoints right because if you train the model and i train the model on separate branches and we try to merge that we just have two binary files that differ and they just to the, to the for the purposes of these systems and to get lfs which underlie many of these systems there's nothing you can do. You just have two different versions of binary blobs. You, you the user, have to figure out what to do yourself. And also, the if I change, if I train the checkpoint at all, if I modify it at all, the checksum changes completely. And so I need to st store an entire new copy of the model parameters. And this is kind of different from the way that most version control systems work for code, because I can go into a piece of code and make a little tiny change to some specific lines of the file to implement some new functionality. And the version control systems are smart enough to only communicate kind of the minimal amount of information to realize that change. So again, these systems are very useful, but they're kind of different from what we want to get into today. And let me uh, kind of expand on that a bit by talking about some of the existing work uh, that aims to make collaborative and continual development of machine learning models possible. Specifically, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, briefly mention again some of the work in my group, but also some work by other people on enabling cheaply communicable patches to a model and also methods to merge updates from different contributors to a model. So first let's talk about patches. So I'm not sure if everyone or anyone was at the talk last week, but I talked about two papers from my group along these lines. The first is a paper on a method called fish mask. You can think of fish mask as an alternative to updating all of the model's parameters at every step of let's say training you know let's say we're doing gradient descent in gradient descent we compute a delta for every parameter value and update every parameter value at every iteration of training in fish mask we identify a subset of the model's parameters preferably at you know a tiny subset like a small fraction of the model's parameters and we only update those parameters and then again if we want to communicate this change we only need to update we only need to communicate which parameters we change and what their new values are so we're basically doing sparse updates Another paper from my group that I mentioned was this paper on parameter efficient fine tuning and a method called IA3. You can think of IA3 in one of two ways, either as scaling the activations at different points in a transformer architecture, or equivalently, you can think of it as rescaling the columns of a couple of weight matrices with a single vector uh, for each weight matrix. And again, rather than updating the entire weight matrix, if we just do a multiplicative update to the columns via a vector, it's going to be much more communication efficient. And in the case of this method IA3, we were able to update you know, a tenth of a percent or fewer of the model's parameters in order to get it to do new things. 
But I won't talk about either of those methods in a lot more detail since I spoke about them a bit last week. So now let me talk about some other work along these lines, kind of to motivate the feasibility of doing continuous and collaborative development of machine learning models with an iterative version control system. So the first that I'll mention just briefly is, and I'm going to kind of mention examples of different classes of methods. I'm not trying to highlight these methods because they're particularly unique. Uh, but one example of a method is a, a, a method that updates a subset of the model's parameters is BitFit. And in BitFit, you just use a heuristic, which is to say, let's just choose all of the model's bias parameters. And in this case, it's a transformer architecture. And we're only going to update the bias parameters. And why choose the bias parameters? That's up to interpretation. One easy reason is just there aren't that many of them. They take up a very small proportion of the total parameter count of the model. And it turns out that, especially for a pre-trained model, you can adapt the pre-trained model to do new things just by updating the bias parameters. And of course, you can update other subsets of the model's parameters to get it to do, to do new things too. But BitFit is one example of a method that you might use to communicate a cheaply communicable update to the model's parameters just by updating a subset, namely the bias parameters. So along slightly different lines, but still kind of a parameter efficient training method is LoRa. This actually came out of MSR, I think last year. And what LoRa does is for each weight matrix, it learns a low rank update to the weight matrix. So you keep the pre-trained weights of the model, the existing weights of the model frozen, and you learn two vectors or two uh, matrices that are themselves low rank, compute their outer product, and add that to your weight matrix to get a low rank update. And as you can imagine, the number of parameters that you update corresponds to the rank of these matrices, the rank of this update, and can be a lot cheaper than updating the full matrix. Another example is the, this finding that if you want to train neural networks, a lot of times you can actually do optimization in a low dimensional subspace. And that the dimensionality of that subspace is often a lot smaller than the full dimensionality of the model. And this was, to the best of my knowledge, first observed in, in this paper listed on the screen here. The way this is done is by, instead of just optimizing the parameters directly, producing a random matrix. Here it's a projection matrix they're calling P and doing optimization in a lower dimensional space that gets up projected by the projection matrix to the parameters space. So in this case, they're showing, let's say that my parameters, I, you know, my model has three parameters, so I, my parameter space is three dimensional. I can compute a projection matrix P that projects from a two dimensional space to a three dimensional space. So I can only optimize two dimensions instead of three. And the reason that this is a parameter efficient method is that if you, rather than communicating the uh, projection matrix, which it can obviously be quite large, you can just compute, you can just communicate the random seed for that projection matrix and leave it up to you know, downstream systems to reconstruct the random uh, projection matrix. So you need to communicate your low dimensional update, your projection matrix seed, and you can do this effectively. And in, in this paper, they show that the intrinsic dimensionality of, of many tasks, and sorry, the intrinsic dimensionality is what they call the dimensionality of the subspace that allows effective optimization, in their case, achieving 90% of normal training's performance. This intrinsic dimensionality is a lot smaller for many tasks. And also subsequent work showed that it's a lot smaller if you start from a pre-trained model too. So again, just another totally different parameter efficient updating method. And I'll mention one more uh, from the federated learning literature. Uh, in this case, again, this is kind of an orthogonal idea. It uses a method similar to fish mask where you identify a subset of the model parameters to communicate updates for, but then it adds an additional step, which is a ternary compression step where you look at the changes, how the parameters that you are changing have changed and compute the mean absolute value of those changes. And then you either communicate a negative change in that direction, a positive change in that direction, or no change in that direction. And so this allows for even more compression of your updates. And it turns out that this works quite well in federated learning settings and actually adds some robustness to 
different workers training on differently distributed data. So again, lots, lots of orthogonal methods exist for doing parameter efficient updates. Some of them only updating, you know, a small, small fraction of the full model's parameters. So doing this thing where every time we change the model, we have to communicate an entirely new copy of the model's parameters is probably unnecessary. We have a lot of nice tools in our toolbox to make communicating those updates a lot cheaper. Okay, so that's some existing work on patching. Now let's talk a bit about methods for merging. So, you know, merging comes up when contributor A takes the model's checkpoint, trains it, does some, let's say, communication efficient updating method to it, and the contributor B takes the model, does some other stuff, and they did it in parallel. So now how do you combine those updates? So in the merging models with Fisher weighted averaging paper that I mentioned last week, we kind of developed a framework a conceptual framework for what you the kind of things you can do with merging that you can't do with standard training. We also developed a, an improved method for doing merging. I'll talk about that in a moment. But just to clarify, if you are forced to update your model via sequential training, you know, I'm just doing iterative training, let's say via gradient descent, then you're kind of forced to do something the things that can be diagrammed like on the top of the screen here. So we take a pre-trained model, we do some subsequent training on a downstream task, or maybe we take the pre-trained model, we do some subsequent training on an intermediate task, a donor task, and then some more training on a downstream task. We kind of have these, these uh, sequential graphs, and that's the only way that we can train models um, with, with standard training. But with merging, the difference here is that we can have, we can start from one model, we can train multiple versions of that model, and then we can combine them in some useful way, hopefully retaining the capabilities of the models that are being merged. So for example, we could take a pre-trained model, fine tune it a bunch of times on the same data set, and then merge the result for kind of like a pseudo, pseudo ensembling method. We could replicate the idea of intermediate task training by taking a pre-trained model, fine tuning on a separate tasks and averaging the result. Uh, and you can also do more esoteric merging patterns like the other diagrams shown on the screen here. So methods for quote unquote merging have actually existed and are widely used in federated learning. And the, the most basic method that works remarkably well, and there's been some work recently trying to explain why it works well, is just simply averaging the updates of the individual workers. So this is a diagram, a, a reasonably nice diagram of what happens in federated learning from the, the ternary compression paper I mentioned earlier. A server has a copy of a model. It communicates changes of, to that model to individual clients. Those clients perform training on their local devices via, let's say, SGD. They communicate their updates back to the server. So now the server has, quote unquote, conflicting updates from each individual client because each of the clients updates are kind of out of date with respect to each other. They all started from the same point and kind of diverged in different directions. So what should you do? Well, it turns out that if the model has been, if you start from a trained model, if you just average them together, do a naive averaging, it works remarkably well. So this technique of averaging together the changes from individual workers that, uh, that is quite common in federated learning has been used in other settings. One example is in this nice paper on uh, branch train merge, where, which you can really think of as federated learning where the individual workers are training on, uh, federated learning for large language models where the individual workers are training on text data from different domains. And again, the workers just train on their, their do domain. And then when you wanna combine the updates from the individual workers, you just average their updates together. And it works quite well as it, what they're calling it an embarrassingly parallel method of training models because the workers can compute their updates completely in parallel. This has also been shown to be useful for making it so that a, what, what is called an open vocabulary model can improve performance on a downstream task without sacrificing performance on the original task. So these are uh, vision transformer models that were trained on some original tasks. Here they're calling them the supporting tasks and then fine tuned on what they're calling patching tasks, which are like downstream tasks you wanna improve the performance of. So if you take the fine tuned model and you average it with the pre-trained model, you can actually get a much better trade off between the accuracy on the original pre-training tasks and the accuracy on the downstreaming tasks. And if you vary the weight between interpolating the, between these two checkpoints, the pre-train and the fine-tuned checkpoint, you can get different trade-offs between the performance in these two settings. 
it's also been used as a way of kind of making intermediate task training more general and useful. So uh, in a method that's called uh, that's been called fusing. So in fusing, we take a pre-train instead of taking a pre-trained model and fine-tuning on our downstream task, or pre-training a model, fine-tuning it on uh, at a single intermediate task, and then fine-tuning on our downstream task, where the intermediate task training stage improves performance a bit. The idea is that we take a pre-trained model, we fine-tune it on tons of tasks, that we just naively average all of the parameters together from all of the fine-tuned models, and then fine-tune the fused model on our downstream task and show that it improves performance over using the pre-trained model. So parameter averaging works quite well and works in a wide variety of settings. But we actually can improve over naive parameter averaging, which is what the uh, Fisher merging paper that I talked about last week does, where rather than just taking an unweighted average of all of the individual models to be merged, we compute a weighted average where the weighting corresponds to each individual model's uh, an approximation to the uh, model's Fisher information or the parameter's Fisher information. Another approach that improves a bit over naive averaging is this technique from the Git Rebasin paper, where the idea is that rather than just doing naive averaging, we compute a permutation of the model's activations, or equivalently a permutation of the columns of the model's weight matrices, so that they match up in some I don't want to say optimal, but they, they, they're, they are uh, approximately optimal way. Um, and in doing this alignment, uh, permute, this permutation makes parameter averaging work better because it turns out over the course of training, sometimes the purposes, so to speak, of the individual activations, the features they represent, can permute even though the function that the neural network represents doesn't change. So doing this permutation step, again, can also improve over naive averaging. So merging to a certain extent in certain settings does work. Usually it involves parameter averaging, sometimes with a little bit more cleverness baked in. One more method that's not exactly parameter averaging is from this very recent paper called Editing Models with Task Arithmetic. And the idea here is that if we take a pre-trained model and we fine tune it, and then we just compute the difference in parameter space between the fine tuned model and the pre-trained model, we can call that a, they call it a task vector. And that vector represents how to change the pre-trained model to get it to work on a downstream task. And if you take these task vectors for different downstream tasks and combine them in different ways, interesting, you can get the model to do interesting things. So for example, if you fine tune the model on a downstream task, compute its task vector, but then negate it, you can make the model worse at the thing that you fine tune it to do. So for example, if you have a language model and you fine tune it to generate toxic content, you compute that task vector and you subtract it from the pre-trained model, the model actually generates less toxic content. So you're kind of approximating the full fine-tuning run just by a single update step from the, the pre-trained model to the final model. You can also do, to some extent, multitask learning and a little bit of task analogies. Very interesting stuff in this paper, a surprisingly simple method that works. But it's not exactly parameter averaging, it's just adding uh, task vectors together. So again, we, we have we have some different methods for doing merging that can work in certain settings. OK, so we have we kind of have some OK patching methods and OK merging methods. So now what we, what we don't have is a system that allows us to track these changes and manage contributions to a model. And I'm going to argue that we, we I'm going to describe what I think we kind of need for such a system to exist. And in doing so, we'll argue that we can build such a system. And then I'll show you the system that we're starting to build. Um, so what, what do we need? We need to be able to track changes to a checkpoint. And there are lots of ways to change, to, to modify a checkpoint. We can update all the model's parameters. We can choose a subset of the parameters like BitFit. We can add or remove parameters to the model. We can change parameters, shapes, so on. And the system should be able to support all of these operations. We need to specify some on-disk format for these changes. So if we have a model checkpoint, and we update some of the parameters, we need to be able to have a standard format for how that changes is represented, should support all of the update types that I just mentioned. We need to be able to restore the previous state of a checkpoint. So if I realize that some update to my model is actually harmful, I should be able to rewind history. I need to be able to communicate and receive history. So if I take the model and I do some training, I should be able to communicate those changes to you, and you can decide if you want to include them in your model too. And 
we also need to be able to identify and hopefully possibly resolve merge conflicts. So again, if, if two individual contributors compute changes to a model that conflict with each other because they're based on you know, the same uh, now out of date version of the model, the system should either just fail and say, hey, I, I can't merge these things together, or ideally and maybe eventually try to provide some methods for resolving them, like saying, hey, okay, you know, I can average these parameters together, but let's give it a try. Um, and finally, it should be very straightforward to adopt this into existing pipelines. So if I take a model and I perform some parameter efficient training to that model, I shouldn't have to write a bunch of more code, jump through a bunch more hoops to get it added to my model's history, and it should integrate into existing pipelines. So we've started to work on a system that looks something like this. Um, we, are, we have been calling it Git CML. It's based on Git. The problem is there's actually a system called CML that it's for uh, continual machine learning. It's basically a continuous integration testing system for a machine learning model. So if I update my training code, it trains the model for me and tells me how it works. So we're going to call it something else. If you have any naming suggestions, feel free to suggest them. I'm currently a little bit partial right now to Git Theta because you know we usually call machine learning model parameters Theta. Uh, but you know, again, if you have any uh, suggestions, feel free to make them. And I'm going to try to do uh, the very ill-advised thing of doing a live demo of this system. Um, so let me. I, I'm assuming you all can see my my shell now. Um, if you can't, then you know holler. Um, so let me just start. I have this little, uh, a couple of pieces of code uh, for training a model, tra training individual parameters, adding new parameters. These are fake little model training loops. Um, let's just uh, start by initializing a Git repo as we always would, and maybe add the, the, all of the code that I have, and then I can commit and just say add the code. Okay, so this is all normal stuff. And now let's just train the model. So this is gonna be a, a fake training loop that's gonna train my model. I have a supercomputer, so it only took you know one second to train my model. And now if I look in my directory, I have a model checkpoint, okay, alongside my my uh, my training files. So this shouldn't be super out of the ordinary, but now we're gonna get weird and we're gonna actually uh, track the model checkpoint. Okay, with Git CML, and so what Git CML does, in, uh, at least right now, and it, this is all subject to change, is it. Uh, let me actually just go ahead and um, add the model. So you can see what it did is it added. They created a subdirectory .git CML that stores the model. And the way that it stores the model is actually by splitting up what we call the parameter groups. So like the weight matrices and the bias vectors. So there's now a separate file and these are uh, stored in a format called TensorStore. It's not terribly important. Uh, that basically just specifies the values of these parameters. Okay, so that's that's kind of like step one to separating things out to make it a little easier to track incremental, incremental changes. So let me go ahead and make a GitHub uh, a remote on GitHub for this. Um, so we can just call it uh, git CML early demo. And let's uh, use the handy code here to add the remote and push it. So now you can see that I have my repo. I have my git CML directory. It has my uh, bias vector and uh, the weight matrix matrix or made up bias vector and weight matrix. But one notable thing is that while locally, I do actually still have the PyTorch checkpoint. If I look at the PyTorch checkpoint here, um, whoops, this is not, see, this is what I get for, uh, yeah, this isn't what I expected. <laughs> this is what I get for doing a live demo. Let's ignore that for now and see how it works. Um, so let's go ahead and, uh, and make a new branch, um, for training the bias vector. And so we're going to train the bias vector alone. Let's uh, let's look at what happens when we say get diff. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, we submitted a, a bug fix like in the last 24 hours that it doesn't seem like I have a, applied right now. Um, so this isn't going to work as I expected. Oh, that's too bad. I really wanted to do a live demo. Um, so what should happen is it should tell me instead of saying these binary files differ. So, so something weird happened when, when I uh, 
when I looked at this file on the remote, it should have not told, not shown it as a view raw. It should have actually shown it as kind of like a metadata file that shows the contents of the uh, of the checkpoint. Yeah, and it's just it's funny. I I did this uh, you know 15 minutes again as a final check before the talk started. But um, oh, I know what I did. Okay, yeah. Um, so I skipped a step. Cool. Yeah. Hopefully, you, th yeah, this is an informal workshop, right? So I can totally mess this up and uh, and you all will forg forgive me. So let's just start again. <laughs> and I'll try to do this quickly so that I don't run too much over time. OK, so let's just start over. I, I forgot a very important step, which was uh, uh, to tell GitCML that I want to track the file. At least I hope this is what, what went wrong. OK, so uh, I'm back to back to starting point. Let's train again. Actually, let's do let's just add the files again. Um, whoops. So I train the model. So I got to do get CML track. And that get CML add. Let's see if that does it. Whoops. Got to add my remote. OK, let's see what happened now. There we go. Yeah, so I just skipped the, the git CML track step. So anyways, now the model, the, the PyTorch, the sort of quote unquote checkpoint file that gets pushed is not the actual checkpoint file. It's not a binary file anymore. It's actually a metadata file that specifies you know, the shape, the D type, and the, just the hash of the parameter values themselves. Um, and the hash is going to be used to check if the parameter values change. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so train b1, Python train b1. And now if I run get diff, it's going to tell me that b1 hash has changed, OK, because I updated those values. So let's do a git cml add and a git push origin. Let's push to the new branch. Um, train b1. And now let's see what happens when we, have to, when we create a pull request and have to do a merge. So let's check out to main and let's um, Whoops. Oh, I, did I forget to commit? Oh, yeah. Oops. There we go. Check out main. So let's go ahead and run a script that adds a new weight matrix. OK, so fake training run. Now we have a new weight matrix. So if I, um, it's going to tell me, oh, now I have a new weight matrix called W2. That's a three by four weight matrix, this floating point, uh, uh, 64 type, et cetera. So let's do a git CML add, git commit, and we're going to add W2 and git push origin main. OK, so now I have conflicting changes on the main branch and on my, my, um, my train b1 branch. OK, so now I'm going to create a merge, uh, pull request. And actually, in this case, it's going to be able to automatically merge them, which is maybe good, maybe bad, because I, you know, if I train one weight matrix and I add or tra train the bias vector and add a new weight matrix, then I actually uh, you know, can combine those changes. They don't touch the same parameters. So for better or worse, I can just go ahead and merge this. So I've, I'm merging that pull request. And now to um, now that I've merged that on main, I can pull main. And, you know, just to show you that it actually does what it's supposed to. Let's see, I can check out head two. And then let's just load the checkpoint. You can see if I if I go back in history, I only have B1 and W1. I don't have W2 anymore. But if I check out main, 
I can um, load the checkpoint again, and there's my W2. So you can see that this is actually a fake little model. But at any rate, so now a couple of things that do not exist yet that we're in the middle of working on. There are branches around that where these are in intermediate stages. One is um, pre pre representing parameter efficient update methods. Um, those are basically going to be stored alongside the model's parameters. And the second is developing smarter diff a smarter diff tool and a smarter merging tool that actually implements um, merging methods other than just naive merging when things don't co conflict. Um, we're hoping to get this into a somewhat usable state by the end of the year at the latest. Uh, right now, it's very, very preliminary um, and only starts to take a step away from just you know store the checkpoint on its own. Um, but anyways, I hope you'll forgive me for doing a kind of uh, janky live demo. And I'll just briefly go through the last bit of my talk uh, to talk about the model that we're using <clears throat> to um, to kind of as a, as a first model to be versioned by this system. So let's just go ahead and try this whole thing about enabling collaborative and continual development by focusing on a specific architecture or making some architectural assumptions. So let's let's talk first about multitask learning. So let's say I have a language model and I want it to perform like these six tasks and maybe some other tasks. And there are some nice existing methods for taking a pre-trained model and doing multitask learning in a way that doesn't cause task interference. And those are parameter efficient fine tuning methods like IA3 that multiplies the inner activations of a model by learned vectors, or maybe uh, methods like LoRa that compute a low rank update to a weight matrix. Also methods like adapters, which I didn't mention today, which inject new layers into the model that are specialized to a specific uh, task. And if you if you think of any of these methods kind of as adapters, you know, basically, and, and here I'm just uh, showing like a capital A task adapter. Uh, you can think of that. You can, if, if you train a bunch of them on different tasks, you can think of the model as making a switch between which adapter it wants to use, and depending on which adapter it wants to use, it will work on a different task. And this framework, this idea, is actually uh, pretty similar to mixture of experts models, where you have a router, and the router's job is to take basically the activations and route them to different layers. Like which of these, in this case, six layers should I use? Um, the only difference between this and this is that in this case there's a router and the router's goal is to decide how things are routed. Here you just route according to what task the input is. Um, but the advantage to having a router is that uh, you can use a model with conditional computation like a mixture of expert style models in either way. You can, If you know what the task is for your input example and you know that you have an adapter for it, you can feed in the activations to a specific adapter. If you don't, you can have the router figure out how to do it for you. Okay, so this leads to an interesting model architecture where the, you're starting essentially from parameter efficient fine tuning methods. And we know that we can get the learned routing to work reasonably well because we can actually train the routers with supervision. Um, we hope that by having a learned router, we could feed in examples from a new task into the model and have it perform that task, even if it didn't have adapters for that task already, because the learned router could decide kind of which uh, adapter should be used per, in a per layer basis. So hopefully it will work well to new, work well on new tasks, which makes it compelling and convenient and, and, e and easy to use. But importantly, most version control operations are trivial. So if you update one task adapter and I update another task adapter, then by definition, our updates don't conflict. We don't actually have to do merging in that case, and our updates are parameter efficient because we're only updating a small subset of the model's parameters. If we update the backbone or the router, then we start to have to think about some of the methods that I talked about today, and it gets kind of interesting. But for the most part, if you assume that most of the time people are going to be adding or updating task adapters, then it should work fine. And yeah, like I said, you could, you could occasionally update the router or backbone, which is kind of like a ma minor or major version update. Um, and you could also consider adapters, you know, beyond task level adapters. You could have some, you could say each task 
it can be decomposed in terms of a domain and a language, for example, for language models. And you can have a separate set of domain adapters and language adapters and so on. And this approach has some precedent in an adapter hub, which is just a big collection of adapter parameters that can get applied to hugging face models. The, the difference is that this would have a learned router. And the, the hope is that the learned router helps it do new things easily. Um, so I'll stop talking now because I, I do want to have time for discussion. Uh, thanks for bearing with me on this uh, uh, kind of very talk about very preliminary stuff, stuff that's very much in flight. Um, if you want to discuss this research direction and possibly collaborate, there is a chat group that you can join on the first link on the screen here. Um, also, as always, if you want to give me feedback on my talk, maybe I talked too quickly, too slowly. Maybe it was a terrible idea to do a live demo. Uh, you can give me feedback anonymously at this form on the bottom of the screen here. So yeah, so I'll stop talking now. Um, happy to discuss any of this stuff or anything else now. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Colin. Uh, for, for the great talk. Um, yes, and we now have uh, 15 minutes uh, up until um, 11 Eastern time, uh, 8 uh, Pacific time. Um, so we can maybe start by, you know, with questions for, for Colin and then delve into. There were some questions uh, in, in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll speak last. So uh, Hossam, you had one. Uh, and then uh, Ashley uh, as well. Uh, Hassan, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so, like, I, I think in the earlier slides, um, there was uh, there was a mention of uh, computing the alignment between, um, I think, two models A and B, right? And uh, and figure out like I, I remember that slide that had a pi, theta A, theta B. Yeah, that mm -hmm. one exactly. Yeah. So there was this um, some sort of alignment between two models in order to merge them. So I was wondering, like, how do they compute this alignment? Do they use mutual information at all? Or like, what is the criteria of merging those models? Yeah, so they're actually there. They propose three methods for finding pi. Um, and honestly, I don't remember all three of them off the top of my head. The one that's the most mm -hmm. intuitive to me is you take some data and you and you feed the same data into both models and you find the alignment where the activations correlate as strongly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, right? Because you know if, if you assume that the models are equivalent up to a permutation, then you just have to find, okay, this, you know, when this example comes in, the activations are like this, and when that example comes in, they're like this. So how do I rotate them to make them um, to make them match up? And 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 I should say this actually isn't the only paper that proposes doing a permutation to make you know, to, to deal with this like well-known permutation symmetry, um, and so there are other techniques that exist to 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 try to to try to do this better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for the interesting talk. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ashley. Yeah, it really was a fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, I, I just wonder if there are examples of routers that learn and activate across different models. I mean, in, in some ways, that's kind of mixture of experts, but there's some co-training, I guess, that happens amongst the different uh, modules. Um, is that necessary, I guess, for to think about that router concept? So do you mean that if I have two, sep like two separate backbones, but with shared adapters? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Um... Not, not that I, not that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, what you know, one way to, like, so for a lot of this work, you kind of have to map the thing that you want to do, the concept from, you know, version control systems, back to what people are currently doing in other settings. And what you're, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but what you're kind of describing is like, if I have a library, a Python library, I can use it in any code base I want. Like, it doesn't, you know, if if I if I have two different, totally different code bases that both need to make an HTTP request, I can import the HTTP request library and, you know, uh, use it in both code bases. You know, in in the parameter efficient fine tuning literature, which is where a lot of these ideas come from, I'm not aware of any paper that's trying to make like quote unquote universal adapters. Um, you know, basically like for any pre-trained model that has, you know, some particular architecture, can I have an adapter that will make all of those models do the same thing? I mean, the, the closest thing that we have, I think, are uh, so, you know, I like to think about all of the applications of all of this across domains, but I think about NLP the most. The closest thing we have for NLP are prompts. Um, and even in the prompting space, it's not really true that 
you know, a prompt that works well on model A works well on model B. Um, and um, there was one of my students had a paper uh, that I'm, I wasn't involved in on recycling. So this is uh, for, for prompt tuning where you're learning continuous vectors to prepend to the input. Basically, learning prompts that can be recycled and reused across models. That's probably the closest thing that I'm aware of. But if there's uh, if there's other work that people know of out there, it'd be very interesting to hear about. Thank you. Hi, so a uh, really nice talk. Uh, my question is about uh, model averaging as a way to combine knowledge across different uh, fine-tuned checkpoints. So I guess coming from the continual learning side of things, weight space averaging seems like a secret sauce because you can essentially train models in isolation and combine them, combine them at a relatively small cost. And I'm curious, what do you think the limits of doing this are in the sense of, uh, I guess, maybe a number of tasks or I guess at what point do you think this potentially breaks down or stop working? Yeah, no, it's a really, really good, important question that you're asking because this is such a simple method and it works in a surprise, you know, it's like at, when you first see it, you think it works in a surprising number of cases. Then when you start to poke around and like think about loss basins and how much parameters change during fine tuning, um, and you you know you think about some of the theoretical work done in the federated learning literature, it feels a little bit less surprising. But it but it always is it always is one of these things where it it feels like it has to break down at some point. And in particular, it feels like it has to break down because your you know the fact that training you know for example in the Get Rebasin paper just because it's on the screen, if you train two models from scratch uh, with different parameter initializations on the same data. This paper basically shows that if you do if you do a permutation, then you can put the uh, solutions found in the same loss basin. And that's really interesting, but it must be brittle because if it relies on SGD, then I can set my learning rate to 10 million and my models will diverge. And of course this won't work at all. Um, you know, th there have to be some conditions other under which this does work and doesn't work. And the same thing is true of uh, task vectors. So to answer your question much more directly, for multitask learning, which again, this seems like kind of like a secret sauce for multitask learning or continual learning, because I can just train models independently, compute their task vectors, add them together, and now I have a multitask model without task interference. It sounds magical. And in their paper, they show that, uh, you know, for one model, um, again, like thinking about the, the language modeling experiments they did, I think you know they they can combine task vectors for up to eight data sets when fine tuning T5, and then performance starts to degrade on the individual data sets. I think it's something like eight. In our experiments in our lab, we it wouldn't even go up to eight. It was in a you know like a, after a couple of uh, you know task vector additions, it start the performance starts to degrade a lot more. And no, we don't. We don't have a good characterization of, of when this happens, and but we we kind of we kind of need it. And you know, parameter averaging probably it, it can't possibly be the only way of finding a mutual region of parameter space where the model works well on all the tasks that you want it to. On the other hand. It must be the case that there are there is a certain number of tasks where you can't find such a mutual region of space, and better characterizing that I think is uh, would be super important. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to I, I want to piggyback on this, and and that's a comment I made in the chat, and uh, people from MSR in this room know that this is something I'm interested in, uh, and uh, maybe I would also want to bring uh, Shubo who replied to my comments. It's it's a question of representation, like in which space do you want to do these operations of adding and subtracting? And and you know, going back to what you said, Colin, I'm I'm dumbfounded that this works so well in the parameter space because this seems inherently wrong to do this in a parameter space. So and and my intuition is that maybe the changes we make are just so small that everything is linearly related. Uh, maybe with some matrix, just like you know your your paper on on Fisher weighted averaging. So it kind of works, but as soon as you're going to make bigger changes, that that's going to break down. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm doing the parallel with with um, standard you know version control, which is we're doing version control in the 
in the code space, not in the mm -hmm. binary space, not in uh, you know in any compiled version, because we believe that the code space is the proper space in which small changes make sense. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes it breaks down, like when you're refactoring some code, then you're changing everything, whereas functionally it doesn't change. But most of the time it works well. Mm -hmm. It feels like to me the parameter space is equivalent to uh, almost binary code. Like this is something we use to perform the gradient, to update the model, to update our function, because this is now what this is what we know how to do. But parameters have functionally are, are functionally meaningless. You can permute them, you can change them. So I, I I'm I'm still struggling to see why this is a good idea to do all of these changes and to do all of this version control in in parameter space. Yeah, I mean I think um, you know your analogy is really interesting. I think the the weird thing and the thing that people are exploiting is that if you think about parameter space as like binary space or something like that, the weird thing is that if you write some code to do something and I write some code to do something and we compile our code to machine code, then up to some very easily resolvable differences, like permuting in, in the case of model parameters, it compiles to the same machine code. Right, that's that's kind of like the argument of the Git rebasing paper. It can't possibly be true in all cases, but that's like that's kind of the distinction that makes this stuff work. And you know the um, the big difference between you know wh why do methods work without the permutation that we've used in the past? Well, it's because we're all starting from the same pre-trained checkpoint. So I guess it yeah, like you said, I guess it turns out that we're not actually moving that much in parameter space. Um, I do think you know. I, I, and to, you know, to, again to the last question, like we already have and will run into issues doing this. Like it can't possibly work in all cases, and it has to break down uh, at some point. And you know, thinking about other spaces to do uh, to do merging, other techniques that don't involve naive parameter averaging, just. It, it has to be the case that there are things that work better. I, I, I totally agree with you. I don't know what they are, um, but but I'd be interested if anyone did. <laughs> Shubo, do you want to say something? Yeah, so um, one of the things, Colin, that I observed even from your branch in March paper is that all these models tend to have very similar architectures. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if I change my model definition a bit, maybe use layer norm, which was not existent before, which maybe introduces slightly more uh, weight variations. Mm -hmm. So I guess one of the assumptions could be if you measure the uh, difference in the weight variations, they are not a lot. Basically, you can bound them. Mm. Uh, but if my uh, gradient updates or the model weights change quite a lot, maybe averaging them would uh, get my model in a different area of the loss basin. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, like, what are the inherent assumptions that we make? when we consider that the weight averaging would work quite well for a certain say class of models versus the others. Yeah. Um, I think the assumption, the assumption that we explicitly make in the in the Fisher merging paper and the assumption underlying most of these um, most of these parameter averaging methods is that the training is not going to move any of the models to be merged into a different loss basin. They're all part of like a, a the same region in parameter space where any linear combination results in a good model for each individual task. Um, that's the, that's like the the main underlying assumption. It seems to be true in practice a lot of the time when you're doing fine tuning of a pre-trained model. Um, it relies, like I think you were getting at at the beginning of your question, it relies on the assumption that the models that are being merged have the same exact architecture. Um, and just kind of as like a totally separate thing, I mean, I think maybe this is one possible uh, alternate way of doing things to, to Nicola's question. You know, a fallback is always distillation, right? If, if uh, especially for a quote unquote open vocabulary models that you know always generate text or something, um, the input and output space is always the same. So we can always combine the quote unquote knowledge of two models by doing distillation. Um, but distillation is extremely expensive and it's not obvious again, like there there seem to be cases where distillation would break down too. 
Um, but you know, if, if I have two completely different architectures, I can still somehow combine their knowledge via, via distillation. I'm not sure if that totally answers your question, but at least that's what I've been, been thinking on. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Colin, for the answer. Yeah, and I saw your you posted this paper in the in the chat. I'm not sure I had seen it, but it sounds sounds cool. Take a look. Oh, I actually know I had seen this. It's it is very cool. Thank, thanks for sharing. We have we have two minutes. I don't know if someone else wants to say something again. It doesn't need to be a question for Colin. Um, Uh, I can uh, ask uh, yeah. one more question. Alessandro, do you want to go or? Uh, no, no, please go ahead. Uh, more questions. Sounds good. Uh, so you briefly touched on the question of what would you do if you have a bunch of adapters trained on a specific backbone, you then update the backbone. What do you do with the new adapters? How do you make them compatible with the, the new checkpoints? Mm. Um, I'm not sure if there's an easy answer, but I'd be curious to see uh, what you have to say for that. Yeah, there actually is a, again, like you have to map the version control things you want to do to existing settings. And there is some existing work on what at least one paper calls backwards compatible representation learning. And, and this, it, because it really starts to matter, for example, if I build a, what are people calling them? I think they call them like a, I don't remember what they call them. But like if I if I have a bunch of images and I want to represent them in a shared space where I can do like search and retrieval much more effectively, they call them something indexes. It's like a buzzword. Um, if I do that and then I update the representation producing model, then I, I don't want to have to update all of my existing embeddings, right? But I, I want new embeddings that I produce with my new model to be compatible with the old embeddings. So again, this is this is making the representations line up with the existing adapters might be possible. The other thing I'll say, though, is that if you're updating the whole model, you could just update the adapters too, probably. <laughs> At that point, you know, if you're if you're going to be implementing what you know what we might call a breaking change, um, you can do all of them. And you know, a lot of <clears throat> I think it's really exciting to be working in this area because there there's so many open questions and interesting things that are really useful. But one of the goals behind the model that I mentioned at the end that we're just starting to work on now is to make as many assumptions as possible that we have to do as little research as possible to get it to work. You know, like what architectural constraints can we place on ourselves that we don't have to worry about merging very much and we don't have to, you know, parameter efficient updating just happens by default. Um, and the hope is that will actually produce a useful model that people want to contribute to, uh, but we'll see. Okay, thanks for Colin for the talk and your thoughts. Thank everyone for participating. Uh, we'll now have a five minute break uh, and then it will be uh, Eduardo uh, for the next talk. Cool. Thanks and everyone. Thank, thanks See so much then. again for the, the, the wonderful discussion. I will uh, present Eduardo in uh, one minute. Is to a small uh, kind of introduction. Eduardo, so he's an assistant professor in NLP at the University of Edinburgh and an affiliated researcher at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he has been a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford and postdoctoral fellow in Mila. And uh, uh, he's interested in sample efficiency for NLP, uh, modularity, therefore disentangling different facets of knowledge and recombining them in original ways in order to better generalize to novel tasks and in grounding uh, language learning and use in perception and action. So uh, with this, uh, thanks uh, Eduardo for accepting uh, for this talk and uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much for the invite. And uh, it seems um, this is the perfect venue uh, because I can already see a lot of connection uh, between my talk and uh, Colin's uh, talk, as well as many papers that were posted in the uh, group chat. Um, so I think this will also provide interesting um, points for our discussion. Um, so as uh, Alessandro mentioned, um, this work um, that I will present it shortly uh, is centered around the problem of uh, task level generalization uh, and it proposes as a potential solution um, designing neural architectures with a modular design. Um, so in particular, uh, this is um, the work I did uh, while I was a postdoc at Mila, 
Um, and the main paper was in collaboration with Alessandro, Siva and Joshua. Uh, and some very uh, interesting recent extensions in collaboration with uh, Lucas and Nicola, who were also part of uh, Microsoft um, in, the, in Montreal. Um, so um, very quickly, I will go through uh, the question of what even is Mazda's learning? What are the current main challenges we're facing? Uh, I think like uh, we're all aware we're going uh, towards um, a direction where we are training models uh, with a growing number of tasks, uh, which in the extreme case uh, might even include multiple modalities such as uh, language, uh, vision, uh, grounded learning in a reinforcement learning setting. Uh, and one example is Gatto uh, from DeepMind this year, but there are multiple very large multi language models that are coming out lately. And um, some of the most important challenges um, we face when we train these models uh, are the following. Uh, one is how do we even prevent uh, negative transfer? Um, so this is a phenomenon where there is interference between the training signal uh, of different tasks um, in the say space dimension and in, in the temporal dimension uh, we see the problem of catastrophic forgetting uh, which is uh, basically a failure to retain old knowledge uh, when updating the model to incorporate new knowledge from new tasks. Um, the other main challenge is the failure of many of these multitask models to generalize systematically. Um, and I will define shortly what I mean by that. Uh, but to give an example of negative transfer, um, there is this very um, interesting uh, work uh, which is called gradient vaccine. It has an analysis of the kind of gradients you receive for multiple languages when you train a neural machine translation model that translates multiple languages into English. And so you can see the source languages both on the X and Y axis. And you can see that while between languages that are related to each other, that for example, are both part of the Turkic family, the gradients are on average very similar, so they lead to the same local minimum. Um, for many language pairs, this is not the case. Um, and so usually you find minima for the respective tasks, which would be a specific language translated into English that are very different and far apart. So how do we even prevent the gradient signal from these different tasks to conflict with each other? Um, the other challenge I was mentioning is systematic generalization. Uh, in this case, um, there are at least two facets that I think are relevant here. Uh, one is the problem of recombining skills. So assuming that new tasks are composed of sub problems that were observed during training, but that are composed in new combinations that the model has never observed. How do we make sure that master's models are capable of generalizing by recombining some autonomous faces of knowledge that they had previously disentangled during training. Here, you can imagine two tasks during training with pink and blue on the one hand and orange and yellow on the other hand. Uh, and now we want to generalize to a new task at evaluation time, which has a certain set of sub problems, which include uh, the orange skills and the blue skills. How can we create models that are capable of this kind of generalization? The other kind of generalization we're generally interested in are local adaptations. So usually at evaluation time, we encounter distribution shifts that are local. So they regard only a subset of the skills necessary for a task or a subset of the features that we encounter for input examples. And we want to update the model with respect to the features for which the shift happens while retaining the same behavior for the rest of the skills. So what I will try to convince you uh, during this talk is that modularity is potentially a solution for both these two uh, great challenges that we face in multitask learning. Um, but what is modularity in the first place? So I take a definition of modularity as uh, the correspondence uh, or even more strictly an isomorphism between strongly interconnected structural components of a network, which can be modules, and the specialized functions they perform. 
And you can see two examples here of a modular and a non-modular network where basically on the left, you can see that there are two clearly separated um, components that are responsible for different functions, which is the red function and uh, the blue sub function. And then on the right, you have a entangled model uh, where basically there is no clear separation between these two components and the sub functions uh, they encapsulate. And we know from biology that modularity, for instance, is very important in animal brains because it favors evolvability, which is the ability to adapt to changing environments that share common sub problems quickly. Uh, and that is because it is much more efficient to rewire a modular network as opposed to rewiring a non-modular network. So how can we use modularity to adapt general purpose multitask models in an efficient and systematic way whenever we encounter new tasks? Uh, there are at least two important directions of research um, in the research landscape uh, that I think are worth mentioning, and I think uh, Colin already uh, mentioned them in, in the previous talk. Uh, one is parameter efficient fine tuning, um, where the idea is that we train adapters that update only a subset of the parameters of a model in order to steer its behavior towards a specific task. Uh, here, for instance, low rank adapters are simply uh, new parameters, which are those in pink, the a low rank matrix that is element wise summed on top of the pre trained linear uh, parameters of the que uh, sorry, a query key and value of a regular transformer layer. Um, and similarly, you have many kinds of adapters in other one that is worth mentioning because we also use it in our experiments is sparse adapters, uh, which is a kind of adapters that uh, I uh, designed in collaboration with uh, Alan Ansel, who is a PhD uh, at Cambridge, uh, whose idea is um, very similar to low rank adapters with the only difference that instead of low rank matrices superimposed to pre-trained weights, we have sparse uh, matrices. So matrices where most of the values are just zero. And obviously, low rank adapters have the advantage of uh, time complexity as they are much more efficient given the current uh, GPU architectures available over compared to the sparse adapters. But the advantage of sparse adapters is in addition to um, space complexity, their high composability, which is one of the problems that also were mentioned in the previous talk. And here the problem of composability is solved uh, because due to high sparsity, most of the parameters that each of these sparse adapters modify uh, do not overlap with each other. So they update a distinct subset of parameters whenever we want to superimpose or compose different sparse adapters. So each type of adapter in, a, in the end uh, comes with some pros and cons. And in fact, um, you can see here this uh, very interesting um, recent work um, that proposes a new kind of adapter, which is uh, IA cube, and compares pretty much many of the proposed adapters in the literature. Uh, and on the left, you can see the trade off between performance and the number of parameters updated, um, which is basically a measure of space complexity in a way. And on the right hand, uh, the trade off between performance, accuracy, and uh, the um, time complexity they incur. And you can see that. Uh, while uh, many of them actually provide great benefits in terms of time efficiency uh, and parameter efficiency, their performance is on par or even superior to the fully fine-tuned models. And in a way, it has already been shown that uh, parameter efficient fine-tuning has a high potential in terms of recombining knowledge from different domains to generalize the new tasks. Um, this is the case, for instance, of cross-lingual transfer. In this case, we might train separate adapters for different languages like Gaelic, Thai, Inuktitut, and so on, and different applications like parsing, dialogue, and reasoning, and then create the appropriate combination to generalize to new tasks with the correct neural parameters. Uh, so if during training we have an adapter for dialogue in English uh, and the separate adapter for the Gaelic language, then at evaluation time, we can mix and match them to create a new adapter combination, which is for dialogue and Gaelic. Um, but then the question is, um, these cases are quite straightforward because we know in advance what 
kind of adapters we need to recombine, and we know which knowledge each adapter should capture. So uh, in a way, we know both the identity of the skills that we want to capture and the combinations that we desire at evolution time. But in many cases, we do not have this knowledge a priori. And so the question is, can we learn this end to end, both the latent skills of a model and the way to recombine them? Another relevant line of work is sparse mixtures of, of experts. Um, in this case, usually uh, we do not superimpose adapters on top of a pre-trained model, but we start training from scratch uh, a transformer architecture where instead of a single fit forward uh, function per layer, we have multiple ones. And then we have a routing function that determines which one is selected for a specific example. But these architectures so far have focused on scalability, so uh, creating very large language models instead of trying to determine how much this favors generalization, which is the focus of this work. And also usually the routing function itself uh, is either a hard selection where one or more um, uh, fit forward networks are selected uh, or a soft allocation where we have a soft max that allocate a certain gate to each of the fit forward networks. Um, but uh, I will argue this specific routing function does not favor the recombination of the experts, which we call scale here. Um, and so we will try to devise a better inductive bias to learn modules that are likely to be recombined in new original ways to generalize the new tasks. So to do that, uh, we propose this model, which is called polytropon. Uh, this is um, a, an adjective referred to Ulysses in the Odyssey, which means uh, with many skills. So it is appropriate for our model, uh, which should encapsulate many different skills for different tasks and recombine them to provide task level generalization. Um, so in a nutshell, the idea is then jointly learning modules, which in our case are implemented as adapters and an allocation matrix that is binary and allows for variable size selection of adapters. So now we have parameters theta, where we have multiple skills. To each of them, there is a corresponding adapter with a certain parameterization. And then we have another matrix Z, which is basically a matrix that allocates some of these adapters to each individual task. And importantly, this matrix is binary so we have no soft selection and also we can easily allocate multiple possible modules to each task and for example for a given task we might find out that we want to activate just two of the possible adapters from our skill inventory in this case the blue and red adapters uh, each of them in the example is implemented as a sparse adapter so to compose them we just sum them and then we use this adapter which is the combination of the active skills to process the current example to model the probability of y given x so in brief uh, we propose to use uh, adapters as modules uh, instead of fit forward networks uh, as in mixtures of experts and also we propose a new kind of routing function which is not a simple softmax um, such as in mixture of experts, uh, but rather to allow for variable size selection, which is also discrete. So a uh, task adapter or skill adapter is either active or inactive. We uh, use a Bernoulli uh, distribution, which is relaxed. Um, so basically we uh, sample each entry in the task skill allocation matrix from this probability distribution. And this way we ensure that we can easily uh, select multiple sizes uh, of skills for a given task and also encourage their recombination. To further encourage the model to learn a, an interesting and non-trivial structure for the skill task allocation matrix, we also study a series of inductive biases. Uh, one of them is a prior over soft partitions, which is basically soft clustering. Um, and basically we 
uh, experiment with imposing this prior over our matrix of allocations Z. The other idea, which is much simpler, but also more effective, is uh, introducing a sort of course to find dynamic where we encourage the model to first learn the allocation of skills and then learn the parameters of each individual skills by using a dual speed learning rate. So a more aggressive learning rate for the task skill allocation matrix as opposed to the skill specific parameters. And so to put our model in the larger picture of modular architectures, uh, we can consider how we implement the three main ingredients to create a modular architecture. Uh, the first ingredient is how do we implement each module? Uh, as I mentioned, we do not have standalone fit forward networks. Instead, we propose to use low rank or sparse adapters. Uh, but obviously, our method is compatible with any kind of adapter. So each individual adapter is a skill and which is latent and we want to allocate through a routing function. So in the example I gave before of cross-lingual transfer, the routing is deterministic. We know which skills we have to compose for new tasks. Here we want to learn uh, the allocation of the adapters. However, rather than using a softmax, as in mixture of experts, we propose using sigmoid with an Indian buffet process prior or some other inductive biases such as dual speed learning rate to make sure that we learn a non-trivial structure of allocation for our skills. And finally, as a combination function for the output of each individual module or adapter in our case, uh, we use just a deterministic function, which is the average over the outputs. So we evaluate our model in uh, two main settings. Uh, one is instruction following on the Baby AI uh, platform. Uh, this is a reinforcement learning problem where a model has to follow an instruction that is pick up the gray box behind you, then go to the green key and open a door in a 2D environment. And to do that, it has to perform a series of actions, which in our case are conditioned on the specific skills are allocated to our task. And for instance, um, this specific task might require us to be able to pick up objects and go to certain destinations. So these are the skills that we use to perform actions uh, within the environment for this specific task. And then the second um, set of problems uh, that we use to evaluate our model um, is few shot adaptation to new tasks. And to do that, uh, we use this benchmark uh, called CrossFit, uh, where basically the setting is uh, we are given um, a hundred forty tasks for training, uh, and we use a multitask pre-training to learn our skills, and then we have twenty tasks that have been held out, uh, and on which we evaluate the few shot adaptation capabilities of our method. And uh, just worth mentioning uh, that basically these 160 tasks in total encompass pretty much every possible task we can find in NLP, ranging from question answering to conditional generation, such as translation or summaries, classification, and regression tasks. So uh, this is a pretty general purpose benchmark uh, that includes a wide array of NLP tasks. And uh, we compare our model, uh, which we call Polytropon or Skill, since we have these latent skills we want to learn, uh, with a series of baselines. Uh, well, the simple uh, baseline is shared. Uh, basically, the idea here is that we want a single adapter that is shared across all tasks. And this is equivalent to setting the allocation matrix to a matrix of a vector of one. Um, then we have another simple baseline, which is private, where each task is instead assigned a separate module, a separate adapter. And this is equivalent of an identity matrix as an allocation uh, matrix Z. Then we have a baseline called expert, where Z is fixed a priori. So again, it is not learned, uh, but 
it is also based on expert knowledge. So for instance, in baby AI, we have multiple tasks which are different levels that require specific skills. Again, for instance, opening doors or navigating a maze. And we know which skills correspond to each level. So we can fix our matrix to allocate skills corresponding to the way the levels were created in the first place. And then we compare with two non-trivial baselines, which are based on um, state-of-the-art methods for uh, task level generalization. Uh, one is high performance, uh, where each task is represented as a vector. And then uh, we have a hyper network that conditionally generates the parameters of an adapter based on the vector of the current task. So here the key difference is that, as you can see, not only the task representation is not the binary matrix of skills and is basically um, entangled a continuous representation, uh, but then the generator is shared across all the um, adapters or modules. So in this case, there is no separation between active and inactive modules. And then the final baselines is task uh, mixture of experts um, with some tweakings to make it compatible with our method, because as I said, uh, originally they just used fit forward networks and not adapters. Uh, but here the idea is again, uh, that we use a different routing function and we do not use any inductive bias to make sure that uh, the matrix of allocations that we learn encourages recombination of skills uh, to generalize the new tasks. And uh, here you can see the results for reinforcement learning. Uh, on the y-axis, you can see the success rate. So whether the instruction has been accomplished in a given amount of time um, and uh, perfect success rate is of one. And on the x-axis, you can see the number of episodes that are required in order of the thousands to reach a certain level of performance. And you can see here that uh, skilled, uh, also known as polluter point, the method we proposed, uh, is vastly superior in terms of um, space, uh, not only space, but also um, sample um, efficiency, uh, because it requires much less episodes to reach an almost perfect level of performance of 0 0.9899. Uh, as opposed to the three other baselines uh, of uh, shared, private, and expert. So interestingly, it even surpasses expert knowledge uh, that a priori decides which skills are necessary for each task. And this is because sometimes the skills that we need to generalize a new task have a different level of granularity compared to those uh, that were posited by experts. And uh, the results for the second set of experiments, which were based on CrossFit, uh, use uh, Bart Large as the base model that we adapt through our modules and compares um, all the previous baselines that I mentioned. Um, so you can see um, the different models on the X axis and then the average metric on the held out set of 20 tasks uh, that I mentioned uh, for CrossFit. Um, interestingly, uh, high performer uh, performance is inferior to shared um, because high performer performs very well uh, in uh, training tasks, so to the test set of training tasks, but fails to generalize well in a sample efficient manner to new tasks that it has never observed. And then we also compare with task mode um, that also performs pretty well. Uh, but we find that our method actually performs the best with a margin of around two point with respect to the best base languages TaskMo uh, and with large margins with respect to all the other base lengths. And then you can see that comparing our method to uh, the shared baseline, where well, basically again, we have a single adapter for all the tasks. We also perform much better um, on average uh, on most of the training tasks. So in this plot, you can see the delta in performance, which is red if this positive and blue if it is negative uh, between polytropon, our method and the shared baseline. So uh, another interesting aspect of our method is that it allows for 
a higher level of interpretability as now you can inspect your task skill allocation matrix where for instance here you can see on the x-axis the 160 tasks in CrossFit and uh, since this is just an illustration a setting where we have just four possible skills and you can see that uh, there are all possible combinations of these skills across the different tasks um, and the columns that are empty are basically just the tasks that have been held up so they have not been trained yet so all you can see here is just the training tasks and by learning a um, hierarchical clustering over this uh, latent matrix, we can also learn the re relationship between tasks. And uh, I'm afraid the, the size of the task labels are, are very small, but um, from here you can at least, uh, I hope, see that uh, similar tasks receive similar skills. So in the same um, cluster for many of the classification tasks from glue, for instance, or in the same cluster for uh, several tasks that pertain to similar domains, such as Twitter, as opposed to, say, Wikipedia, and so on. Uh, before we end, uh, I also wanted to mention some recent extensions um, that uh, will appear in a uh, workshop at NeurIPS. Um, where um, Lucas um, has studied how to even improve uh, Polytropon and the expressivity of the method. Um, and in particular, uh, the new proposed method is a sort of multi-head skill allocation. Uh, and to make the model more expressive, not only now we have a different inventory of possible adapters for modules for each layer, but also we partition the input dimensions into K sets, and each of them receives a different subset of adapters, or again, uh, adapter splits it can choose from. Uh, and notably, this does not even require extra parameters. It just needs to factorize the input and uh, the adapter parameters appropriately. Uh, but it gives the model much more expressivity over which skill it requires to model a certain subset of the features of the input for a specific layer. The other interesting uh, question that appears in this paper is, can linguistic instructions for tasks substitute modules? So uh, another possible baseline I didn't discuss so far is actually not trying to learn skills that correspond to certain tasks, but rather writing the linguistic instructions that we can use as prompts uh, to condition the model behavior and make sure that it uses the correct set of skills to perform that specific task. And to evaluate that, um, he ran uh, some experiments on uh, the natural instructions um, data set, where basically a set of tasks is paired with the corresponding instructions on how to solve them uh, in natural language. And here, uh, T5 is used as the base model that we adapt through our modular adapters. And interestingly, if we compare um, a set of baselines um, based on, again, the average performance on the tasks that have been held out, um, we find that um, Polytropon surpasses also the full model fine tuning on the different tasks. Um, but uh, interestingly, a more expressive version of Polytropon that, again, uh, has a multi head uh, selection of modules, even outperforms the vanilla version of Polytropon that I uh, discussed so far. So there are many possible extensions of the model that are possible, and also there are interesting avenues of research in terms of understanding how much modules can help generalize better as opposed to just providing linguistic instructions. And since full fine tuning in this case has access to those linguistic instructions, but still underperforms Polytropon, we can at least draw the conclusion that in this specific data set, um, skill learning is even more important than prompting with instructions. So just to give a very short summary of the discussion so far, um, we proposed a, an efficient way to perform master's learning by implementing skills through adapters. We propose a series of inductive biases that encourage the skill recombination for new tasks uh, at task level generalization, 
uh, by proposing a routing function that allows for variable size module allocation and that provides binary selection of um, as opposed to soft selection um, of modules and also some inductive biases such as dual speed learning rate that create the sort of cost to find dynamic in first selecting uh, the allocation and then learning the skills uh, specific parameters. Finally, in terms of experiments, uh, we show that compared to both uh, our baselines and a series of state of the art methods, uh, polydropin and latent skill learning provides higher sample efficiency in multitask reinforcement learning problems and also better fissured adaptation performance in multitask supervised learning. Um, if you're interested um, in this work, uh, this is the reference we released this work uh, early this year around February, and you can find the corresponding code base here. Uh, feel free to uh, give any suggestions on how to improve our method or combine it with the many interesting alternatives that have been uh, discussed so far. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Eduardo, for the great talk. So. Uh, now it is the time for questions. We already have uh, like two questions in the chat. Uh, maybe Stephanie, you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, cool. Um, yeah, first, thanks for the uh, talk. That was really interesting. And I'll definitely check out the paper. Um, so I'm interested in the uh, claims about interpretability. So first, I was wondering, um, have you evaluated these claims with a human study? And also, um, what actionable insights do these representations enable? Um, often part of interpretability is not just being understandable for the sake of being understandable, it's because it provides some actionable insights to, for example, an end user. So I was curious about that as well. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for the questions. Uh, for the first question, no, we didn't run a human evaluation study. Um, we just ran some uh, ablation studies measuring the properties of the matrix we learn uh, for allocations. So for instance, we find that uh, it is indeed uh, almost perfectly binary, uh, even though we use a relaxation. Uh, we find that indeed uh, the entropy of a possible combination of skills is, is very high. So if the model uses as many possible combinations as possible, it doesn't just reuse the same patterns of skills over and over. Um, but yes, we do not have any human judgment determining that this is indeed the case. Uh, also because uh, based on our results, it seems like human judgments over what is the ideal allocation of skills um, is indeed inferior to the one we learn end to end. So an interesting analysis could be, for instance, measuring the overlap between what we expect is a good skill allocation uh, with respect to what the model actually learns uh, from data. And um, as I mentioned, there is definitely some overlap. There is definitely some patterns you can extract from this kind of um, hierarchical clustering, uh, but it is not always straightforward to do so. Um, so I'm not sure what could be the um, actionable uh, conclusions we can draw from this analysis, uh, because in a way we, we turned the problem on its head by saying uh, we did not assume the, the human uh, skill partitions to be optimal. We, we just want to measure their optimality based on the ability of the model to generalize well. And that's what we consider an, a, a correct skill prediction in a way. I see. Thank you. Um, to your first point, uh, yeah, in some previous work that we did as well, um, we also found that uh, task hierarchies discovered from data also differed significantly from expert to final. And so it's cool to see a similar result in um, a different work. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have. Um... Additional question from the audience. Maybe I can uh, put one in the mix. Yeah, so 
um, so uh, maybe I have uh, several, but also I go a bit biased because I'm, uh, I have some knowledge about this work. So uh, like maybe uh, a first a first uh, kind of uh, question that they can, came to my mind is that basically right now you do not use at all um, some, some some sort of prior knowledge of how the tasks are similar or uh, or different. Mm -hmm. So basically this model is completely unsupervised. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether there is some uh, some way of integrating that information into the model and whether a kind of, for example, I don't know, some uh, task embeddings that might come from encoding like task examples into a latent representation with the pre-trained model and then try to enforce some similarity between the latent allocation between the tasks and those mm -hmm. uh, kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's a great question okay. and it actually relates to the fact that um, I discussed a um, mixture of experts models uh, in a setting where the routing function depends on tasks, but in fact, what you could do is actually, which is the, the common setting actually, uh, the routing uh, based on the input um, and even going to the extreme of allocating different tokens, to different experts. Uh, the problem with this, and there are a very interesting recent papers, uh, one from Arteche from 2021, uh, the from Peter's this uh, very large survey on sparse uh, mixtures of experts um, that show that the mixtures of experts that are conditioned on examples are very brittle to uh, distribution shifts. So these models actually perform much worse whenever you try to generalize to examples that you have never observed, which is usually the case for new tasks. Um, and so actually using tasks uh, like task level routing as opposed to example level routing provides more robustness in terms of task level generalization. I see. And uh, actually this bridge is caused by uh, like like domain shift, the fact that basically examples look like don't look like uh, kind of examples that you haven't seen during pre-training and therefore kind of the router uh, cannot generalize well to those or it's because like actually you do not have like the right skills and there is no right. Yeah. You have I'm not sure like the, the evidence we have is uh, I think like ex the, the experiments uh, Arteche explicitly constructed was uh, sourcing other domain text from different domains. So if the language model was trained on articles from Wikipedia, then the evaluation tasks were sourced from Twitter, again, a different domain. Um, so this is the, the evidence we have that example level routing is, is indeed quite brittle. Um, the other sort of negative results we have on the ability of example level mixtures of experts uh, to generalize uh, is again from this survey from Fidus that shows that there is not always a good correlation between pre-training these models and fine-tuning on specific tasks. So even though um, modularity as proposed in uh, MOEs um, facilitates language modeling in terms of performance, this does not always translate to the downstream tasks. So there is also this problem of knowledge transfer between pre-training and, and fine-tuning whenever we operate at the uh, example level. I see. Uh, so I can go ahead, but uh, if I will leave uh, the floor if someone has another question. Well, I can't read the chat, but if there is any question in the chat, I'd, I'd be happy to, to answer that as well. There's no question in the chat for now. Okay. Ah, Shubo has a question. Please go ahead, Shubo. Yeah. So like this thing about example versus instance level versus token level. So I wonder like if we are in a, let's say, natural language generation setting where we are interested to do, say, neural machine translation. And in that setting, you can also consider tasks to be like different language pairs. Mm -hmm. So like what are the modifications that we need to make uh, in the current setting, either with regard to the model settings or the interpretability analysis to change it from again, like instance level to a token level generation setting? Right. Um, so as for generation, uh, I don't know if, um, I understand your, your question um, exactly, but 
Um, if the question is, if we can go from instance level in terms of like task level to example level for uh, specific examples, in a way there is no uh, modification necessary because like if we operate say in a setting where we want to translate a uh, multilingual NMT model that translates from multiple languages uh, into say a target language and then we want to consider each possible pair as a separate task then hopefully uh, what you would expect from this model is allocating similar modules or adapters to languages that are indeed similar. So hopefully you would discover like a similar uh, hierarchy as the one I'm showing here, not for tasks, but for languages, where languages from the same family, for instance, or the same genus would probably share the same skills and so basically be routed to the exact same function as opposed to languages that are typologically or genealogically very different from each other. I see. So like uh, the loss functions would be quite different, right? Maybe like uh, typically for the generation models, you likely have some kind of auto regressing decoding loss or for example, say encoder decoder loss. Uh, would that be easily adaptable to the framework or like maybe certain mm, components need to be changed to adapt to the new task setting? Uh, not really, because actually the uh, model we're using here is a an autoregressive model. So in CrossFit, all these different tasks, including classification, are recast as basically text to text generation. So all these tasks already imply the ability to generate a sequence of tokens in output uh, and use that as the downstream loss we use to both update the adapter parameters and the task scale allocation matrix. OK, awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so yeah, maybe last question, like what next? How are you looking to extend this framework or what other new problem settings are you considering? Right, so um, this is a good question in the sense that I think um, what I found especially interesting in the modularity literature uh, lately uh, was the problem of actually understanding to which extent um, the sub functions that each module encapsulates uh, are um, composable on the one hand and uh, reused for similar examples. Um, because there are interesting analysis of even the vanilla neural networks that are not explicitly modular. Uh, for example, this um, paper from 2021 from uh, Chordas, um, I think from Schmidt Uber's uh, group, um, they found that the way neural networks behave um, does not actually encourage sub networks, so subsets of parameters that are responsible for certain functions to be reused for similar inputs or even composable whenever we want to achieve this sort of systematic generalization. And so my current research is partly on which sort of auxiliary objectives we can use uh, borrowing ideas from uh, information theory to make sure that we can easily recombine and um, do that in a predictable way to generalize systematically whenever you have like multiple adapters corresponding to different skills. I see. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Eduardo. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, maybe we can um, take a few minutes uh, of a break before the next uh, short talk at uh, 12 p.m. That sounds good. Perfect. Yeah, thank you very much for the invite so, again and thanks, thanks for your questions. Lot, uh, thanks a lot for the great talk, Eduardo. So thank you, Christina, for uh, accepting uh, to give this talk. So Christina is a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and her research interests are focused on natural language generation and evaluation with a particular interest in robust and sample efficient methods for task and domain generalization in the context of low resource text simplification. And uh, Christina has interned uh, with Dong and myself uh, this uh, summer. And so uh, she agreed to present some of her work. So thanks, Christina, again, and please. 
Hi, everyone, and thank you, Alexandro, for the kind introduction. Um, it is my great pleasure to present today BEAMED, Finding Effective Permutations for In-Context Learning. This is joint work with my amazing collaborators, Kodia Malkin, Tong Wang, and Alessandro Sordoni, who are also the main contributors to this project. In-context learning is a recent paradigm in the field of natural language processing that has become popular with the release of the OpenAI GPT-3 pre-trained large language model. Basically, in, in context learning, we are feeding as input to the pre-trained model a set of a few training examples all together with a test instance. And the model is able to decode the output without any update to its parameters. This is why in-context learning is also referred to as learning without gradient updates. And it presents numerous advantages, including the fact that we can use in-context learning to rapidly prototype NLP models. Moreover, we can reuse the same model to solve different tasks, which results in the benefit that um, the memory requirements and the system complexity are reduced. And finally, and most importantly, it can yield state-of-the-art performance on many tasks and data sets. However, despite its advantages, in-context learning does not come without challenges. And um, a recent paper, Fantastically Ordered Prompts and Where to Find Them, published in ACL this year, has shown that there is a lot of instability associated with in-context learning, particularly the older spines that the order of the training examples can make performance vary from near random to near state of the art. And this phenomenon occurs across models of all sizes. As we can see in the figure on the right, it is not related to a specific subset of the training examples. And the good permutation for one model is not transferable to another model. And this leads the authors to conclude that some permutations are fantastic while others are not. However, this work does actually not define what makes a permutation fantastic. So it leaves this open research question. In another paper uh, that was published in ICML 2021, the authors um, also find um, that um, the performance of in-context learning can be influenced by the prompt format, by the selection of the training examples, as well as their ordering. For example, in the plot on the right, we can see that for a sentiment analysis prompt, accuracy can vary from near chance to near state of the art by just modifying the um, training examples we are using to construct the prompt as well as their permutation inside the prompt. The authors find uh, there are three main challenges associated with in-context learning namely the majority label bias, which means that the model tends to predict answers that appear frequently um, in, in the prompt. Uh, they also identify recency bias as another problem for in-context learning. And this means that the model tends to predict answers that occurred near the end of the prompt, as well as the common token bias, which means that the model predicts answers that are frequent in the pre-training data. All these biases are undesirable, and they actually lead to a shift in the output distribution of the model. So motivated by these open challenges associated with in-context learning, we would like to investigate um, and experimentally confirm evidence from the literature with respect to recency bias and order sensitivity of these large pre-trained language models when used for in-context learning. At the same time, we would like to quantify the effect of number and order of examples on model performance. And particularly, why is the ordering of examples so important for in-context learning? Could it be the case that the fantastically ordered prompts paper finds those fantastic permutations because those, per, uh, those prompts actually contain the important examples close to the test examples? At the same time, we would like to come up with solutions to these existing problems. And we would like to determine if it is possible to mitigate the order sensitivity of the pre-trained model, as well as to increase the sample efficiency of in-context learning. So we aim to give answers to these questions in the present work. 
In our experimental setup, we are focusing on the particular task of text classification on a wide variety of data sets. As shown um, on the right, we are using 11 uh, data sets. And as the evaluation metric we care about, um, uh, we use classification accuracy. As we train models, we use models from the GPT-2 family of models, as well as um, the larger GPT-3 uh, pre-trained model. In our first experiment, we would like to investigate the quality of examples. In particular, we would like to determine if best prompts always include the same or similar examples in best positions. So to this end, our approach consists of the following steps. Given a set of examples, we evaluate all permutations of these examples, and we identify the top 5% best and worst permutations, as well as the rest of the permutations. And then we measure the intra-group correlation, meaning the correlation between similar groups, such as best, best, worst, worst, rest, rest, and the intergroup correlation between distinct groups, such as best, worst, best, rest, and worst, rest. The challenge here is to actually quantify these across seeds and data sets. And in, in this heat map, we are actually plotting our results across different seeds and data sets. And um, what we are noticing from this plot, actually the way to read this plot is that uh, the lighter the color, um, this corresponds to a smaller difference in the distribution of the examples. Um, and what this plot indicates is that the intra-group difference that we can see on the diagonal is actually much smaller than the intergroup difference, the rest of the elements that are not on the diagonal. And this indicates that um, uh, the, uh, when, when we are looking at the elements of, on the diagonal, we can see that best and worst performing orders, they tend to display consistent patterns and that these patterns are different from each other. So we can see that the best patterns are different from the worst patterns. And this actually indicates that there are indeed good examples and bad examples. And this insight helps us to explain why the fantastical the order prompt paper is able to find those fantastic permutations. Basically, those fantastic permutations contain the good examples placed close to the test example. So having established that, our, our goal moving forward is to come up with strategies that allow us to identify the best, uh, the best training examples that we can use to construct prompts for in-context learning. And one such strategy would be to rely on a naive approach that is ranking single examples by their individual accuracy scores. The main motivation behind proposing such a strategy is that while, while, we, uh, while it is crucial to find these good examples, uh, the ranking approach allows us to uh, identify these good examples without evaluating all possible permutations. So it is more efficient. And in our approach, we are, um, uh, we, we are evaluating each example separately. And uh, then, we get the score from the pre-trained um, um, language model uh, for that particular example, and we proceed to ordering the examples inside a prompt according to their scores. And we are doing it in either ascending or descending order, and then we finally run the resulting prompt. Corresponding to these two strategies for ordering the training examples, either ascending or descending, we have two different functions, which is greedy sampling best when we are ordering um, the examples in ascending order inside a prompt. And this basically means that those important examples that have the highest scores are placed close to the test example. While when we are ordering the examples in descending order inside a prompt, this means that uh, the examples that have the highest scores are rather far away from the test example. And intuitively, we expect that a greedy sampling best strategy is able to outperform a greedy sampling worst strategy, allowing us to demonstrate the importance of placing those important examples 
close to the test example when constructing prompts for in-context learning. As baselines for this experiment, we are using a random baseline, which means that we are just randomly ranking the examples inside the prompt, as well as the, the state-of-the-art fantastically ordered prompts baseline, which randomly samples 24 permutations out of all the possible permutations of the training examples and selects the top performing one. In our results, we can see that a greedy sampling uh, best strategy is indeed able to outperform a greedy sampling worst strategy, which confirms our intuition that placing the important examples close to the test, uh, the important examples close to the test example is able to yield benefits, is beneficial. When we are comparing this with the random sampling baseline, we can see that the random sampling baseline is rather competitive, indicating that um, while by no means we should include bad examples in prompt construction, the definition of good tends to be rather fuzzy and that those very best examples may not always need to be ranked in the very top position. When we are comparing this approach with the fantastically ordered prompts baseline, we can see that it does indeed yield state-of-the-art performance. So we, we are aware that this ranking strategy is rather naive and we need to come up with better approaches for identifying those important training examples. So the main contribution of our work is beamed a strategy for finding effective permutations for in-context learning that is based on beam search. The beam search algorithm can help us um, filter out the bad example and only use good examples for prompt construction. And the way it works is that it's able to construct the prompt incrementally by adding one example at a time. So it starts with identifying the top scoring example and it has the second best conditioned on the first um, example and so on. And the main advantage behind Bean Search is that it is cheaper and more efficient than enumerating all permutations of the training examples. Bean Search consists of three stages. There is an expansion, an evaluation, and a selection step. And in this, um, in this figure is illustrated an input set of examples that we receive as input. Uh, in, initially, we consider each example as one of the candidates for um, expansion. We evaluate each of these candidates and we score them. Then we rank them in descending order of their scores and we only preserve the best performing candidates uh, for expansion in the uh, next steps. Um, for, for expansion, we also adopt uh, some heuristics. The first one is a class balancing heuristic, which means that um, we are only uh, expanding prompts uh, which contain examples of the least represented classes, meaning that we want to make sure we don't add many examples of the same class when constructing partial prompts. And the candidates for expansion are examples of classes that have not yet been added to the partial prompt. At the same time, it may be hard to expand and evaluate each prompt with all the remaining candidate examples. So to this end, we also rely on an example heuristic, which means that we pick examples for expansion that have good performance across past evaluations. We evaluate all these candidates' prompts on a probing set using both unsupervised and supervised metrics. And However, we notice that beam search can overfit to this probing set. So to this end, we decide to split the probing set into a training set where we are searching for prompts and a validation set where we select the top, the top performing prompt for testing purposes. We also include prompt dropout to avoid overfitting. And this also increases diversity and uh, help, helps us reduce overfitting. In terms of our results for beam search, when we are optimizing for accuracy and we are measuring the final accuracy on each given task, uh, we observe that beam search is not only able to surpass our previous ranking strategy, as well as the random sampling baseline, but it can also outperform the state-of-the-art fantastically ordered prompts uh, baseline by 3% accuracy. And this result is actually very encouraging and denotes that 
Beam Search can actually find those important, those good examples for prompt construction in a way that is also cheap and efficient. And if we are to analyze the length of the beams um, found by Beam Search, we, we notice that on average, the length of the beams uh, found by Beam Search is 3.229 compared to 12 for FOP. And what this indicates to us is that Beam Search not only outperforms FOP in accuracy, it is also able to find short prompts, meaning that it can efficiently use a few shot training examples. These results are very encouraging. Um, and while, um, while the, the, the results we just presented were using uh, the GPT-2 uh, Excel model, we also test to see if our insights hold when we are using a larger model, such as GPT-3. And it turns out that on GPT-3, we can still outperform um, uh, the FOP baseline by at least 1.6%. And it is the case that uh, for fair comparison, we conducted um, the beam search such that the search complexity of the best permutation is matched with the search complexity of FOP. Um, so this actually um, tells us that if we would not be running beam search unconstrained, if we would were to run beam search in the unconstrained setting, we would probably be able to obtain even higher scores. At the same time, we are noticing that in this constrained search setting, um, the uh, beam search algorithm currently has some difficulty when we have tasks with many classes and we could overcome this limitation by allowing the beam search to search deeper through, through the multiple labels that belong to the different classes. So far, we have established that beam search is an effective strategy for finding good examples for prompt construction that is cheap and efficient compared to enumerating all permutations. And it can also efficiently use few shot examples and the beams returned by beam search are small. And this motivates us to even improve upon beam search by proposing a mixture model with the shorter prompts identified by beam search. So basically, this um, beam search mixture um, is uh, motivated by the idea that the model is not able to efficiently use examples that are very far away from the test example. And in order to better utilize the examples, our main strategy is to regroup them such that more relevant ones are closer to the test example. And the mixture of prompts formula here corresponds to Bayesian averaging. It's basically the formula of the predictive distribution where the latent variable is the prompt. And theme search is actually a way to produce samples from Q of P, where Q is the Bayesian posterior restricted to the examples found using beam search. And it has similar computational cost to using one longer prompt. When assessing the results for the beam search mixture and comparing them to the results for the beam search itself, we can see that the beam search mixture presents um, slight improvements over the beam search algorithm itself. And this is actually very promising, denoting that uh, in this mixture of shots model, placing, regrouping the examples and placing more relevant examples close to the test example is able to yield further benefits. However, there is also a limitation of this beam search mixture of shots model. In particular, when beams are too homogeneous, the mixture performance tends to suffer. So a way to alleviate this problem would be to ensure that the beams are diverse enough. And um, we are currently looking into ways that could allow us to add diversity to the mixture um, and we believe that this holds further promises to improve the current results. So the main takeaways of uh, this work is that we have established the, why the fantastically ordered prompt paper works and why some prompts are fantastic. The explanation is that there are good examples that are placed close to the test example in the prompt. And this is what makes some prompts fantastic. Having established that, we focused on identifying the good training examples only. 
And to this end, we initially tried a naive ranking strategy uh, where we established there is um, a lot of value in placing good examples close to the test example. And motivated by this, um, these insights, we, um, the main contribution of our work is uh, leveraging Beam Search for prompt construction and for finding those good examples. And we demonstrate that it can surpass the existing state of the art by 3% accuracy. And even more than that, it is efficient and it also finds uh, short prompts and it's actually a very efficiently using uh, those few shot examples. And this motivates our uh, final experiment where we are using the short beams identified by beam search as part of a beam search mixture model, uh, which we currently uh, see it can, it holds a lot of promise to improve our results even further. And as part of ongoing work, we can, uh, uh, we, are, we are looking whether it is possible to alleviate the issue of um, homogeneous beam search predictions by incorporating diversity into the mixture. Thank you very much. And I am happy to answer any questions. So thanks for the talk, Christina. Uh, are there any questions uh, uh, from the audience? Yeah. So, no questions. Um, so let me think about the question here. Because I know they work very well. So, you know, which ones? We, we already speak about some questions. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I have presented this work uh, uh, before. Uh, so, yeah, here I think that we need to find like ways of um, making Beam Search Explore more in depth when there are like uh, a lot of examples. Because basically, when um, Actually, there are uh, like when, when basically the task has a lot of labels, for example, classification task with uh, 10 labels or something like that, uh, it means there are 30 examples to, to rank. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes what happens is that uh, with the fixed kind of computational budget, um, uh, it cannot like the, the, the beam search procedure cannot really like search uh, uh, in depth. And uh, basically, one thing that uh, we found so was that, um, like for uh, GPT two XL, uh, there is uh, like the beams that are found are much shorter than the GPT three um, beam. So I feel like GPT three has uh, more capacity of uh, like exploiting more examples in the prompt for some tasks. And so this is really an open problem. I don't know if someone has uh, an idea of. Uh, uh, how to fix actually this problem. So there are some heuristic maybe that we can uh, uh, apply to to beam search um, to make it uh, yeah explore deeper. I guess it's an open problem. Okay, well, if uh, no one has questions, oh, Tonga uh, has a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, I. Okay. I don't have an answer to your open problem, but I do have another open problem of my own, which is we started this project thinking of uh, trying to figure out what are the good examples, what are the bad examples. Uh, but uh, in the end, we end up identifying some of those without the ability of saying why certain examples are good, why are they helpful? Rather, we just measure them by uh, you know, they improved accuracy. So I think uh, along this line, we should also maybe probe a little uh, further, like uh, what really make an example better than others are uh, more effective in for certain test cases. Just a just, uh, uh, comment. Yeah, this is a great point, Wong, and thank you for, for mentioning this. Um, as part of ongoing work, um, uh, we we should also be looking into this. Totally agree. Okay. Cool. So, um, ah, Subo has a question too. 
please go ahead this one. Yeah, so again, this is more of like not uh, OK, maybe like. So what we have been looking at. Is suppose your models are very different capacity. Is there a way we can learn? Uh, which are the examples to route to which models? Suppose you figure out that some examples are easy. You could route it to smaller models like say maybe GPT-2. Mm. Some are harder and you could route it to bigger models like GPT-3, right? And like we're trying to figure out how to do that. And um, the basic thing is to figure out the difficulty, like easiness or hardness of an example. And it seems like at least from our preliminary ex explorations, it's quite difficult to judge the hardness of an example using a deep learning model because they tend to be overconfident in nature. The more the model capacity and the, the more it overfits or rather the confidence extremely high and the uncertainty is low. And I'm just wondering like if you explore some similar or thought about similar things which related to prompts on how it applies to smaller versus larger models, the uncertainty. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's more of kind of a discussion, not an explicit question as such. Yeah, I, th I think this is a great point. Um, and I see benefit in routing examples to different models based on their difficulty. But as you say, I think the main question is how to measure this difficulty. And um, um, yeah, I was, it may also be, um, so on a similar note, I was also, trying to look at ways in which we can measure task difficulty. And I know this is, again, another open research problem in the community. So um, I think more research needs to be done, and I'm, I don't have an answer uh, to this problem. So yeah, I think measuring task difficulty and measuring example difficulty could be beneficial. I mean, it would be unfortunate if to understand whether an example is difficult, you have to run the big model. <laughs> it would like, defy the purpose, right? Like one of my hypotheses, suppose you make uh, multiple passes to the network, suppose with something like dropout enabled, uh, then obviously each pass will trigger different subnets of the network. And then if there are disagreements between them, say different subnetworks predict different tables then you are essentially, maybe the model uh, example lies close to some hyperplane, and that is why you have kind of rapidly differing decisions. Yeah, but like, we didn't really, we were able to generalize this uh, to different tasks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep, yeah. so uh, I think we are at time. Uh, we had five minutes now. I think we are all set for a pause. Retrain uh, is 30 minutes pause or 45? It's 30, 30 minute pause, I think. Yeah. Yep, we can go for um, a full 25 minutes if everyone is okay with that. And then we will pick up with a presentation um, by Song Han afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for the talk. Thank you, <laughs> the audience, for the listening. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Thank you, Christina.